Welcome everyone to our final session of the ANU Crawford Leadership Forum. Uh, I'd like to start by celebrating, acknowledging the traditional airwaves and lands that we're meeting of, and specifically the elders past and present of the Ngunnawal Mambri people and traditional custodians for this part of the world for more than 20,000 years. So I also uh, acknowledge that many Australians here today are joining us from uh, all over the world, and I pay my respects to elders past and present across all lands that we're uh, seeing today. So it has been a very intense day and a half here uh, of our uh, ACLF uh, 2021, uh, and it's going to be a final session where we can talk a bit about some of the highest level takeaways that we've had. Uh, now, I very much enjoy being able to meet and greet and have a coffee with people in person and really extend the conversation. We obviously have not been able to do that, but uh, we have had an outstanding set of sessions that I have been able to attend. And I have to say it has been a very welcome distraction for me, uh, not running the university for a day and a little bit and being able to learn and contemplate the big questions that our university of course is here to help answer. Uh, and so I uh, really appreciate uh, the diverse range of panels that we have had, and I've had a chance, I think, to, to learn a lot. Uh, it is great to be able to bring the best people that, uh, around the world together, um, and that will continue here in this final panel, where I'm joined by uh, Dr. Heather Smith and Forum Director Richard Maud. Uh, I just since we haven't actually introduced Richard, you have probably seen him pop up in the middle of uh, Julie Bishop's uh, uh, emceeing when she, her uh, line went off, but uh, he's senior fellow at the Asia Society Policy Institute, in addition to being the director of this forum, uh, noting his lengthy stints at DFAT uh, and also at ONA. Uh, Heather Smith, uh, is commencing as professor at National Security College uh, here in the College of uh, Asia Pacific. But she most recently served as secretary of the Department of Industry, Innovation and Science, as well as uh, the, the Department of Communication and Arts. She has a PhD of economics here from ANU and has served in many roles in government, including in ONA, Treasury, DFAT. And she was the G20 Sherpa when Australia hosted it in Brisbane back in 2014. So uh, let's go through and uh, have a little chat uh, with Heather and Richard about uh, the main things that we've uh, uh, seen and heard. It's so much to cover, but Heather, let's start with you. Um, what are the takeaways, the three or four major, take major takeouts you've had over the last uh, day and a half? Well, thank you, Brian. And it certainly has been a very rich couple of days of, of wide ranging discussion. So I, I've thought of three key takeouts. Um, the first of those is really um, across the world, I think the focus is really on domestic economic renewal and that's going to preoccupy governments for the years to come. So from what I heard yesterday, we're facing a global economic recovery that is fragile, that is uneven, and it's unclear that technology, which we've discussed over multiple forums and still having that similar discussion, whether technology is going to deliver the productivity dividend needed to meet citizens' expectations, particularly now given the generational constraints economies face with high debt and with budget deficits. Um, I heard worryingly that intergenerational inequality between and within countries looks set to increase with all the problems that will flow from that. Um, but in the short term, there was a key point, um, particularly made by the World Bank, that vaccine access is going to really be the key determinant of growth rebounds for individual countries. So related to that, and this is my, my second take out, that Rather than some people saying that the post-war global operating system is being disrupted, my take on, on what I heard um, over the last day and a half is the view more that the global operating system that we have known is not fit for purpose, um, that it's run its course, even as simultaneously we have been shaped by the two themes that have dominated, I think, uh, this 
this group, at least in the sessions I was involved in, and that is obviously great power competition and technological change. But I don't think we've yet got the clarity of what the next model is, um, the organising principle for, for the world. Um, I don't think we're yet in the world of the two block or two systems, um, but a world of constrained globalisation to me seems um, likely going forward. The two sessions that I sat in on, on technology, I think really sort of demonstrated the paradox. And I think it was put really well in, in the US National uh, Intelligence Council's 2040 report on global trends, where we're in a world that is both inextricably bound by cognitivity, but fragmenting in different directions. And I saw this in our conversations around, um, again, technology, where you could say at one level, China and, and the democratic world are on a unity ticket when it when it comes to how do you constrain the market power of technology and particularly digital platforms, but uh, really diverging deeply on the motivations and the objectives of how you approach um, approach that issue. Both seem to be focused on the pursuit of fairness and equity, but with very different um, objectives when it comes to how you constrain the use of technology. So I think, Brian, for me, probably the overarching theme, and it's I'm going local now, is I think it's going to be a lonelier world for Australia to, to operate in. And I, I say that because of a number of cross-currents that, that I picked up. Um, firstly, the increasing calls that we're, we're hearing for greater self-reliance and reconceptualization of the US alliance. Um, there also appears to be a no going back in terms of our previous relationship that we've had with, with China. The new reality, as the Treasurer said yesterday, is that Australia is at the front line of strategic competition in the economic arena. Um, noting, though, I think in Healy's paper on the first day around the defence discussion is really important in pointing out that there's no rhetorical no lack of rhetorical support for Australia on China's economic coercion, but this is yet to really translate into any measures that would impact on China. I think also we, we're, in a, we're in a more uh, lonely world if we remain a laggard when it comes to the decarbonisation of the world. And I think the, the operating model as it evolves and, and Richard's really good paper on the China session talking about competitive coexistence, how will that challenge us in ways that um, we can be effective because it's going to be very hard to really integrate um, a necessarily wide array of policy approaches across our defence and our foreign policy and our economic space. And in a theme that, that I, I thought was interesting from the defence session yesterday, um, use of the language that we'll need to be better at strategic empathy um, that we will need to get uh, be careful in the tone that we adopt within the region, but also to look at our region through others' lenses. Brian, finally, I was struck um, by the, perhaps the disconnection between the Treasurer's comments that implied that the drivers and policies are in place to shore up Australia's resilience, both now and into the future, this stood in contrast to what I thought was the, a very good and rather robust discussion in the session on Australia's resilience that concluded, I thought, that we aren't well placed economically, culturally, politically and institutionally to deal with the challenges and the inevitable shocks that are going to come our way. So that sort of left the, the sort of thought in, in my mind that if this, if this view is right, then the price the Treasurer acknowledged that we will have to be that will have to be paid for this resilience could be significantly greater than is currently understood. So that was my my three takeouts. Thank you, Heather. Uh, certainly, uh, you reflect a, a bit on things like climate change, and it was a very sobering uh, session where the uh, Mark Howden really demonstrated that the predictions around temperature have been pretty well spot on, but we've actually underpredicted kind of the bad bits of climate change, like uh, uh, the actual rise of sea level and uh, extreme weather in ways. And so it's going to be an interesting uh, ride. We also, you also talked a little bit about um, 
what I saw was a consistent message throughout, which is Australia really thrives in a well-working globalized world. And there seems to be downside after downside uh, about uh, things changing to be less good that way. And so uh, Richard, I guess uh, turning to you and what you picked up, I guess, uh, yes, there's a lot of downsides and we keep talking about that, but I'm curious to also know if there's any upsides in all of this. <laughs> You're talking to a foreign policy person. Of course, there are no upsides. Although uh, economists are more gloomy, I think, than foreign policy people. Uh, Heather can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Uh, not much, I have to say, although uh, I will make a point that, that I think is hopeful and positive. Uh, Heather's been very disciplined and given you three things, and doing things in threes is usually best. I've got five. I've sort of got two big thoughts that uh, really struck me. I've got one data point that I found really interesting. I've got one quote that I found really interesting and I've got one, um, one issue that I think it's that, uh, is, that we covered in the forum, but it's not getting the kind of policy or political attention uh, that I think it deserves. Um, can I rather just cheekily up front uh, though, Brian, just um, thank uh, all our participants for sticking with us through the conference. We did design uh, this conference to be done in person. It's a lot of content to shift online uh, in, in the era where people are, are tired of Zoomathons, and I'm really grateful for people uh, staying with us. I'm also really grateful for the many people across the university uh, who helped uh, pull this conference together. Um, not just the, the events people, the program people, the media people, but the broader, um, the broader set of experts in the university who are very generous with their time to be on panels or chair panels and to help me devise panels. So the, the climate change panel, which I thought was terrific, for example, was sort of mapped out um, over a cup of coffee a very long time ago with, with Mark Howden uh, on the university campus. So uh, on to my two big things. Well, look, we, we really, we all know this, I, but, but listening over the past day and a half really rammed home to me that governance and governing is just so hard at the moment. It's never been easy, but when you do a day and a half of this, it just strikes you that the, the size of the challenges we're grappling with, the sheer number of them, um, the complexity of them, and the fact that they're all happening at once. So uh, we've got a pandemic uh, and a health crisis. We've got an economic challenge. We've got a climate crisis going on. We've got the biggest shift in our external um, strategic environment since the end of the Second World War. We've got uh, the tech story. We've got um, pressures on democracy. So uh, systems everywhere, uh, governments everywhere are hard pressed. Our government, our public service is certainly very hard pressed. Uh, it's also tired. And uh, there are a few moments, I think, where that uh, came through and one of our participants noted at uh, one point in the conference that resilience is not just about systems and institutions, but, but also about individuals. I was also struck um, when um, thinking about all those big challenges by the gap between the perception of, or the view of many of our expert panelists about what we had to do now, but also in the future, uh, both over the sort of short to medium term and the long term, the, the gap between that and uh, how the government thought we were doing and what we might need to do, or at least uh, what our ministers and senior officials who were very kind to appear with us were prepared to say uh, on the record. I've got a couple of quick observations about that. I mean, things do often look different inside government, and it's important for universities and think tanks to understand that, especially when they're looking to work with government to influence the development of policy. The second point is that there are limits to the ability of any government to fix really complex problems. But thirdly, and this is, I think, my positive point, and this came through strongly right across the conference, we do actually have the tools and expertise, and we're not short of ideas uh, on how to move forward on any of these challenges across the public sector, in the business community, and within the academic and think tech uh, and not-for-profit worlds. And then lastly, on the scale of this challenge, um, one thought that came through to me across the uh, conference is that leadership counts. It really counts uh, to tackle these challenges. And many panellists, I think, as Heather said, in, in relation to climate change, are looking for uh, more leadership across our nation, a stronger drive uh, to 
get some uh, reforms done that are going to uh, go to these issues that are essential for our living standards, to the equity issues that Heather mentioned, and also to our environment. I think the second big thing that uh, I was really struck by was the Treasurer's speech. It was a strong speech, a really striking one. I wrote a piece a few weeks ago that said Australian foreign policy was now dominated by just um, two uh, super challenges. One was responding to the various dimensions of the pandemic, and the other was dealing with a more authoritarian, nationalist and assertive China. Uh, and if you'd asked me to guess, I would have guessed that the Treasurer would have focused on the first of those dealing with the pandemic, but he chose to focus on the second. And I think that really just demonstrates how much uh, the government is gripped by this challenge from China at the moment, how seriously it takes um, the economic coercion uh, that we're under at the moment. Uh, uh, it's determination not to give in to that. That was very clear in the speech. And also it's confidence in the flexibility of our economy and its ability to adjust to economic pressure. Uh, and then also there was a very clear message for the business community in that speech, which, which I also thought was striking. I mean, we have heard the government talk a little bit like this before, but the Treasurer was very clear uh, that businesses really had to uh, pursue a China plus model, to use his term now, that they had to take diversification seriously, that the risks uh, of over-dependence on China were growing. So this is, you know, uncharted territory, of course, for Australia and no real break for Australia-China relations uh, as far as I can see uh, for the time being. Um, I agree with Heather that we're not seeing a two-block world, but I think uh, through the conversations over the conference, we did clearly see that there's definitely a degree of separation going on now, whether that's on values, uh, or on democracies versus autocracy, whether in part on technology or in the way the multilateral system is working. Uh, and in that multilateralism panel, for example, uh, really eminent experts like Tom Wright are advocating for uh, the demo democracies or like-minded to move on without China and the autocracies if that's uh, necessary to get things done. Look, the data point I wanted to mention, uh, which struck me, came from a really fascinating discussion on uh, liberal democracy and its internal troubles. Uh, and we had Daryl Carp from the Museum of Australian Democracy join us, and she quoted some data from the Edelman uh, Survey of Trust in Government, which looked at a number of countries uh, across the world. Uh, and in, in Australia, 76% of uh, what Edelman calls the informed public trust government, compared to only 48% of trust in Australian government for what Edelman called the mass public. Um, and this has led to a phrase called trust inequality, and it's quite marked uh, in Australia. Edelman himself says that this trust inequality provides ample ground for nationalism and protectionism and uh, he talks about an Alice in Wonderland mo moment of elite buoyancy and mass despair about the way in which democracies work. So the health of our democracy is good, especially compared to the United States. But Larry Diamond also in that session left us with a ringing, uh, a warning that rang in my ears, which was don't be complacent. And he said, don't think that some of what's happened in the US can't happen here in Australia even with the stabilizers we have like preferential voting and an independent um, electoral commission. Uh, my memorable quote uh, is from uh, Dr. Jai Shankar's Crawford oration last night, really terrific speech. Uh, I've since discovered that this quote's getting around a fair bit uh, on Twitter and in the media, but he said, uh, the days of unilateralism are over. Bilateralism has its limits. Multilateralism is simply not working well enough. That leads us to look for more practical and immediate solutions. And that is the case for the Quad, the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue. There's a whole world of foreign policy and strategic assessment in those few sentences, and it speaks to Australian foreign policy uh, as much as it does uh, to India's. And then lastly, my, my issue that I think needs more policy attention and more political leadership. Uh, we had a great session on nuclear disarmament or the lack of nuclear disarmament. 
was a masterclass really with Bob Einhorn from the United States and Gareth Evans. It's a pretty sobering discussion that the uh, the takeout was really that there are no there is no chance of reductions in nuclear arsenals at the moment, and indeed China looks set to increase its nuclear deterrent potentially quite significantly. North Korea has just started the Yongbyon uh, reactor from which it uses to extract plutonium. Uh, so if there's any hope, it has to rely on risk reduction, that is trying to create the conditions and norms that would uh, prevent nuclear weapons ever from being used. But that in itself is a very hard task at the moment and requires some more elbow grease. I'll stop there, Brian. Thanks, Richard. Um... I guess, uh, I mean, you had the benefit of trying to create the uh, sessions here for everyone. Is there anything, so, so clearly uh, nuclear proliferation is something that's gonna come back at us over time. And it's something that seems to diverge slowly over time. Are there other issues you wished you would have included uh, as part of things as we see it now? Oh, look, there are inevitably issues that we couldn't cover or didn't cover enough. Uh, one of them, I think, is that in our own region, we touched a little bit on this in some of the sessions, but if you think about our own immediate relief region, particularly the Southwest Pacific and Southeast Asia, there really there is an enormous task here, I think, for Australia uh, to help those countries uh, recover from the pandemic, to reopen where they can, uh, to restore, if we can help them, some of the lost economic, the economic growth that they've lost and that they've never got uh, back, uh, to deal with the loss of human uh, capital, the increase uh, in uh, inequality, the damage to many small businesses, the damage to health systems. And I think that's going to require new kinds of partnerships for the long term, uh, some creative new thinking, uh, and it really requires, um, I think, more substantial investments um, over and above the increased effort that we are already, credit to the government, is the government is already putting into the region. Heather, you see the world through a uh, slightly more economics uh, lens than Richard, although obviously you do a little bit of everything. Uh, what do you see as some of the uh, other issues that maybe we could have spent more time on? Uh, it was a very comprehensive uh, last, eight, uh, last uh, 36 hours, but anything that we've missed from your perspective? No, I don't think in terms of what we missed, but perhaps in, in terms of emphasis, um, uh, one, one that came to mind when I was listening to the conversations was really how do we think about the longer term consequences of what we've seen in the last year in terms of Xi Jinping's leadership, but particularly the speed with which um, he has been cracking down on business sort of under the guise of common prosperity. I think we need to sort of understand what the implications of, of that are because I think for me, relatedly, there's a question about are we actually overestimating China's financial power going forward? Um, you can still be the largest economy, but not necessarily the most powerful economy, um, particularly with a system that directs capital and increasingly directs technology. So I think that's a that's worthwhile uh, discussion. The second. Second one that came to mind um, in the discussion around resilience and the pandemic was really what are the implications of our fractured federation, you know, in terms of uh, the theme of how do we renew a damaged um, country in terms of the theme of our conference, particularly when we have states in a federation that, that don't accept and don't really take responsibility for the national interest. So how do we actually project a, a coherent and confident view of who we are if we don't come out as one and, and you know, what we aspire to be in this world that we're trying to navigate? So I think trying to understand what the Federation uh, looks like going forward, I think, is, is a key thing. And Heather, if I suddenly made you Prime Minister, uh, what would be the, the thing that you would most focus on 
for the benefit of Australia, uh, and I'm going to make you a non-political prime minister, but a technocrat. What do you think needs the most uh, amount of effort over the next, uh, let's say, two years? Um, well, to me, it's, and this is not a surprise, but it's really, it's the new sources of growth that I think, you know, where are they coming from? We, we're living in a, I think, a fool's paradise. If we think the Australian economy is going to be sustained in a sustained growth surge as we come out of COVID without addressing the underlying challenges. And all of these were traversed um, by many over the last day and a half. But to me, it is this, um, this transition to sustainability and the circular economy and everything that is involved in the, the circular economy needs to be front and centre. And the only way to get there is, is where we've been discussing over the last couple of days is really an integrated focus on innovation. And there are so many the economist had on. There are so many opportunities for Australia um, in this space. Um, I think, though, as we said yesterday, um, it was a good conversation about we can't rely on the old playbook in terms of uh, how we respond to crises, that we're going to have to really think about more services-led recovery and all the issues and reforms that go, go along with that. Um, but we can't yet seem to get through that, that current um, paradigm. Um, so, you know, one of the questions that also, you know, you're talking about is, you know, are governments, are governments up, for these, up for these types of um, reforms? Um, I guess the conversations that I've heard over the last day and a half is that we will be continue to probably be disappointed um, in the pace and focus of, of change. And uh, again, some of the discussions I heard that governments are very good at early stage crisis management, but less, less so in the slow burn challenges that really require anticipation, shared responsibility and bringing the public um, along with you. So, you know, I think it's, um, from the, you asked me to be a technocrat, and, um, but also prime minister. I think, you know, what would you be doing? Well, I think it's about also um, getting, you know, political leadership, which is what Richard mentioned. Unfortunately, it, it does come down to, to that. Um, but I think we're going to need more, more leaders of, of the type that um, Don Russell in, in a really good uh, Monash monograph um, described that you actually need more doers than pleasers, people who will actually do things and bring the public along with them. And that's going to require a more mature sort of political uh, debate than I think what we're currently having across an array of issues. And again, in that same monograph series, I, I think it was, they're both really interesting because it goes to that question of, of how do you get change. Um, Scott Ryan, the president of the Senate also in the same series um, says that it's, you know, it's, where it's really hard where the modus operandi of political discourse is to impugn the motives of, of um, the individual rather than grappling with the issues that require challenging. So I think the political discourse um, and the ambition uh, around political leadership has to, be, has to be part of that to really drive those new sources of growth. Thank you, Heather. Yeah, I mean, certainly my reflection has been if we are going to have a, for example, a China plus strategy, which the treasurer talked about and Richard referred to, uh, I'm in a, a very China exposed industry of higher education and I, easier said than done. And I guess what I'm seeing is we need to actually have the whole uh, way of thinking about higher education policy, in my case, evolve if we're going to do that. I can't just do it on my own. And I think that's true for every in industry. If we really do want to, uh, the circular economy where we clearly have a huge upside, but it has to actually be sort of co-designed between business, academia, and government to make it work. And I'm not sure that I'm seeing the uh, political wherewithal uh, from any side to really do that. It's, it's easy just to incrementally change and um, it will be an interesting uh, evolution over the next few years. Richard, uh, I guess if I were to make you the, uh, the, uh, the technocrat prime minister, what would you be focusing on? You talked about the two key issues earlier uh, for Josh 
Are those the areas you'd focus on? Or are there others? I'm tempted to say that on behalf of all the prime ministers that would come after me, I would build a functional prime minister's residence suited to a G20 country, but I'm sure I'd be held down by my party room. Uh, at least we now have a decent plane that you can take overseas and not be embarrassed by. Um, look, a couple of things. Um, you know, our ability to shape our external environment is uh is is limited obviously now we have agency that's a that's a word that our prime minister likes to use and i believe in it very strongly we do have agency and we should and we have to run a very active um, foreign policy but the parameters of that foreign policy are often quite tightly constrained by external circumstances the choices are often not as large as you might think. I suppose that's a long way of saying, I think foreign policy kind of takes care of itself and I would focus on domestic policy. One of the um, things about the 2017 foreign policy white paper, which as you know, I had a bit of a hand in shaping, it starts uh, before we even get to the foreign policy by saying that Australia has to invest in its domestic strength and resilience. And that, and that was the way that we would thrive in this world that was coming, that we could see dimly then and we can see clearer now about how challenging it was the strength and health of our economy the strength of our institutions the cohesiveness of our society and i still think that's where we we can do better i wouldn't have a long list because governments that try to do too much get nothing done so pick you know a handful of things that really make a difference for the long term even if they're politically hard knowing they're politically hard and try and build a national consensus around them all right. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Richard, and thank you, Heather. Uh, I guess that uh, discussion around the resilience of our democracy, uh, which you've referred to, I think, at length, Richard, really calls into question of whether or not uh, the Australian democracy and indeed Western democracies are prepared to evolve with the times. Uh, and uh, I guess make sure that we really do represent uh, the whole set of constituents across our uh, economies or across our nation, including young people who definitely seem a bit disenfranchised right now, but also uh, the people from all sorts of backgrounds. And we talked about that Edelman Trust Index and that uh, the elite bubble, which I'm afraid most of the people on this uh, call sort of inhabit, uh, seem to have a fairly different view of the world than uh, the average Australian. And certainly for me, one of the things I'm always trying to figure out is how do I connect to Australia so that we can move forward collectively. So uh, in wrapping up, I'd like to thank uh, all of the speakers from all over the world who have agreed to be on our panels. And as I said, it's uh, really uh, those people and their expertise and wisdom and different perspectives that make uh, the Crawford Leadership Forum uh, what it is. Uh, we've had uh, people, uh, again, giving up their valuable time to participate in the conversations uh, from all walks of life, government, business, academia, and uh, that willingness to give freely of their time, uh, their wisdom and insight is greatly appreciated. Uh, we've had many uh, good panel chairs who have gone in and kept the conversation going. Uh, including many members of our own university, but other universities, think tanks, uh, and uh, academics around the world. So thank you very much. Uh, Richard, let me uh, thank you and your team um, taking uh, what is a kind of a, a mumble jumble of ideas and making a nice coherent program, uh, and then having to, at the last minute, switch it to a fully online mode. And that uh, has been not just hard on you, but it's been hard on the entire uh, program team who have been working with you over this time. And I think you've done it uh, exceptionally well. I'd like to thank uh, Miravac, our generous sponsor uh, for this year's forum. Uh, in these difficult economic times, it's great to have this support. I can tell you we're counting every penny within the university sector uh, right now. Uh, and uh, I do thank one and all of our uh, conference participants for sticking with us. One of the things that we're going to do is be asking you to uh, do an evaluation. We use those evaluations uh, to help figure out how we can improve things and look at how we might do things next year. 
God willing, we will have an in-person uh, program again next year. This has been interesting doing the digital programs, but I think I'm definitely looking forward to an in-person one. So uh, we hope to see you all uh, next year, but we would certainly appreciate your feedback about what you all think would make an excellent discussion for Australia and the world to have about how to make the world a better place uh, in our part of the world. So we hope you enjoyed things. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you around the country this year and next year as we open up. Best of luck, everyone. Stay safe, and for heavens to Betsy's, get vaccinated if you haven't already. Cheers. <laughs>